Bonju Habari Zaleo. My name is Daniel Adeni, a professional officer at Eclair Africa. My name is Sinetem Bamtetwa, an intern at Ikli Africa. My name is Paul Curry, manager of the Urban Systems Unit at Ikli Africa. On behalf of Ikli Africa, the African Centre for Cities, our future cities and partners, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers and enablers committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. Rise Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society and the arts. Our entry point is not based on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture while asking, what more can we do to make them sustainable, inclusive, and vibrant? This festival is hosting 46 sessions from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions, and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one of more specific actions that you or your organization will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on these committed actions throughout the year and offer resources, connections, and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize actions, and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond the session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions, Vote for your favorite in the photo competition. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all the attempts to reach out to new people and build long lasting connections. Before we begin, it is important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All the recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. And may I say that creative expression is vital for creating new features for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. Thank you very much. One, when people ask me where I'm from, I tell them I am from red dirt and green hills Endless mango trees whose small sun of a fruit is always within arm's reach. Smells so sweet your stomach speaks in small roars of impatience as you sip your cup of chai waiting for meals to finish cooking. I am from the sounds of my people. Languages so rhythmic you think we spoke in song. The melodies of matatu conductors waving on crowded city streets and the crow of roosters calling the sun from behind the horizon in the village. Two, when people ask me where I am from, I tell them, I am from a country mispronounced into modernity by wandering white men, from big men with small minds who stole the spoils of our struggles with no shame or foresight. I tell them I come from those who resisted, those whose dreams defied their bullets even after their breath was stolen from their bodies. Three, when people ask me where it is I'm from, I tell them I am from a new story about this country, this continent, this world, a new tale told by new authors, unafraid to wield the pen as a small spear, our ancestors as shield, our history as armor, as we use our words to help write this world anew. Hi everyone. Welcome to our session on what is Net Zero, bringing African buildings into the future. It's definitely an exciting topic. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. And um, a big thanks to the organizers of this Rise Africa Action Campaign, to ITI and to our Future Cities and the African Center for um, Cities at UCT for organizing this and for giving us, uh, myself and Mark, uh, the opportunity to join this, this conversation. Um, I think I'm just going to start off with introducing myself. I'm very happy to be talking today with Mark. Um, he is an architect who I think has you know, done a lot of thoughtful work in this space. So I think that you're going to really enjoy um, what he has to say as well. But I'll start off with me. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, my name is Georgina Smith. I head up the tech team 
at the Green Building Council of South Africa, the GBCSA. We live in a world of, of acronyms, so stop me if I, if I do mention one that's not clear. Um, but my role is to oversee how green buildings are verified. And, and so we refer to that as certification. Um, and, and that really, the aim behind that is to try and promote some form of market transformation to move the market in a certain direction with um, tools that the you know, um, market seems as, as valuable. And, and then the other key thing that I look at um, within the GBCSA is looking at our research um, and collaboration endeavors. Um, I think there's a lot of creative collaboration within the, within the green building and the sustainability industry. Um, we really do believe that, you know, it's about getting together, talking through ideas, talking through problems, um, and kind of working together to try and solve them. So that's a big part of our, our ethos in terms of trying to move things forward. Um, but that's it for me. I'll, I'll hand over to Mark while um, I put up my slides so long. Thank you. Good morning or good good evening, uh, depending on where in the world you're listening from. Um, I'm I'm from a Chile, Johannesburg, and my name is Mark Shirt, as Georgina has mentioned. I am a, a professional architect uh, by training and a NETSA accredited professional with the Green Building Council of South Africa. Uh, I have about nine years' experience in the in the building industry, and really, what we're going to be presenting today is. What does net zero mean? I'm sure you've heard it in the media um, or politicians speak about it. And Georgina is gonna take us through kind of the overall definitions in the first kind of half an hour. And in the second half an hour, I'm gonna take you through how do we actually apply this to real African problems. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a lot of questions. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll happily have probably about half an hour at the end to answer any questions. So yeah, don't be shy and we're looking forward to the session. Thanks, Georgina. Take it away. Thanks, Mark. Yes, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the reminder about the about the questions. Pop them in the in the chat function. Okay, so I'm going to kick off, and um, I think the the key objective of my part of the talk is really to share three different things. The first is what does the GBCSA do? And, and more importantly, in relation to this campaign, um, you know, how can we share stories of action? Um, because that's really, I think, where um, there's a lot of inspiration and where there are a lot of interesting stories to be told. Um, and then as Mark said, it's, it's to kind of give you um, a lay of the land of the, you know, of the net zero landscape within South Africa and, and potentially the broader African continent. And then lastly, it's to give you an intro into some of the key definitions and principles behind what you know, net zero action means um, and how that could potentially apply to, to some of your projects. So to kick off, um, for those of you who don't know, the GBCSA is a non, um, non-profit. Um, we're also a member of the World Green Building Council but I think you know what's interesting for today's conversation is obviously is that we have got um, relationships with other green building councils uh, within the African continent, and you know we we either support them with certification tools or just with um, you know kind of advocacy as well. But it's obviously a two-way relationship, and I think that there are some really interesting uh, developments within um, Africa, particularly if one looks at uh, Kenya and um, the kind of green building movements that's, that's rising up there. And then obviously we, we can certify within the broader African um, footprint. And we have certified about 15 projects already uh, within Africa and that spans, it's Namibia, Mauritius, Nigeria, um, Kenya, as I've mentioned. So there, there are quite a few African countries that we've already certified within. Um, so what does the GBCSA do? Um, so firstly, we, we advocate for green buildings, for sustainability, for awareness around climate change. Um, so that would be, for example, you know, attending events such as, such as this. Um, we train delegates as well, and that is typically either in our tools or on issues relating to sustainability. So for example, um, we have trained several um, SMMEs on how to go green. 
and that also have been involved quite extensively in, in public sector training, which is really exciting um, in terms of upskilling um, the public sector and supporting their ambitious road to, to sustainability. And then obviously we, we certify and I'll chat through um, that in a bit more detail for those of you that are potentially not familiar with the term. The building in the background there is the headquarters for the, uh, well, what was formerly known as uh, the Department of Environmental Affairs and what is now known as DEF, which got a six star and they used really um, effective passive design strategies to make sure that it was a highly efficient building and then obviously supplemented with, with PV. Um, just in terms of kind of understanding where we are as a participant within this conversation, and we are one of many and, and really, you know, I'm here to kind of share our perspective with the um, hope and intention that maybe this resonates with something that you're doing and maybe there's a, either a potential for collaboration or if we can support you um, with, with anything that one of your organizations is doing. Um, we typically have come from the commercial space, so big offices, um, and um, the leadership at the time knew that the um, the commercial sector would would run with um, understanding you know the value of certification and they were correct and and the um, uh, certification brand uh, did very well um, <clears throat> since you know it was launched in the market in 2009 but increasingly we are having really interesting conversations and talking about impact and kind of green building impact within the residential space uh, which is obviously very different, um, you know, when one compares that to typical kind of office buildings, and as well as collaborating and supporting um, public sector where we can um, on their green building journey. And that either speaks to, you know, national departments or provincial departments or um, at a city level. Um, so we all know that the, and, and some of you might not know, but the, the construction industry is obviously responsible for significant resource consumption and emissions generation, uh, both globally and within South Africa. Here are some stats, you know, on the slide for you. If we zone in and look at um, our cities, where obviously 70 to 80% of our population lives, you'll see that, you know, if you combine the residential and the commercial and institutional in terms of those sectors where, you know, it would be very building specific, you're looking at 30 to 40% of your city-led emissions. So, when one talks about green buildings, you're talking about a sector that really looks at a significant part of what our emissions generation sources, um, and that's why it's, it's really so vital. Um, I think that part of this campaign is really understanding the need and the urgency to act now, and one of the reports that always resonates with me um, and it was released quite a while ago. It was, um, I saw it in early 2019, but it was where the IPCC kind of detailed the relative effects of um, a one and a half degree um, temperature rise in comparison to two. And you know, you obviously think that it's just you know half a degree, but the effects are exponentially worse. Um, and you know, they were quantified, and they're it's it's quite scary to look at the report and understand how desperately we need to act in order to make sure that we stay on a 1.5 um, trajectory. Some of you might not know, but <clears throat> buildings and building efficiency, energy efficiency within buildings, has been um, proven to be one of the, if not the most cost effective um, ways to reduce emissions, as opposed to looking at things like agriculture and obviously um, kind of energy supply. So it's it's a solution that we have at our fingertips to address um, carbon emissions reductions. The World Green Building Council has, has mapped all of the SDGs, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, to green buildings. And as one can imagine, they speak to at least, you know, nine of the 17 directly. And that really demonstrates that green buildings in relation to um, sustainability and a kind of broader understanding that includes not just you know the environmental aspects but it cuts across people um, profit and planet and I think I just wanted to give you some context and, and some of you might not you know be familiar with this but 
In 2016, it was, the World Green Building Council started with an advancing net zero program. And there were, you know, three key objectives. It was really to raise awareness um, about net zero buildings. It was to try and achieve some level of common language um, alignment around how you verify and how you demonstrate that something is net zero because we're dealing with science-based targets and in some way we need to be able to track our progress. Understanding where we are is really important. And then obviously we and the World Green Building Council, and I think that many people on this call today appreciate that we need to adopt these things at scale. We need to move beyond kind of either just pilot projects or, you know, small scale. This needs to become the new business as usual. Um, and so there are two really important targets that have raised net zero and have profiled net zero. And obviously we're speaking specifically from a carbon perspective, whereas, you know, I will touch on other resources and Mark, um, when he uses some of these projects examples, we'll also go into things. So for example, it's, you know, biodiversity and water or other aspects that can also be net zero. But a lot of this conversation started with the focus on carbon. Um, and that's where there's been a lot of traction um, and a lot of movement. And um, I'll touch on this again later on in the presentation, but in the same way that for those of you who, who were in Cape Town during the drought, when we got the news that you've got to aim 50 liters a day, it really was very effective as a strategy in terms of harnessing action in a very directed, focused way and in a way that we needed, right? Everybody knew around every, you know, dinner conversation, it was like, oh, you know, how am I getting my consumption down to 50 liters? You know, how are you recycling your water from your, your washing? You know, it, it, it really focused action. And so from a net zero perspective, we've got two key targets. We want to make sure that by 2030, which is not really very far away, the buildings that are being built, all of our new buildings are designed to be net zero. The end goal is that by 2050, all buildings, so that speaks to the you know, existing stock, which really is the bulk, it's the, the bottom of the, the iceberg, right? New buildings are at the tip and they don't really represent the majority. The majority are our existing buildings that you love, work and, and play in. They need to be operating at net zero by 2050. So keep in mind, this speaks to operational carbon. So, and, and that's the stage of a building's life where it is in use. So the buildings that you work in, the buildings you sleep in, you know, that's that's what we refer to when we when we talk about operational carbon. Um, subsequently, a lot of the conversation has moved on also to include embodied carbon, which really speaks to the carbon that you need to consider um, the material construction of the building. And that, you know, has been incorporated into the target now as well. Um, and obviously, that's also a function of certain countries being able to decarbonize their grids so that the relative impact of your um, embodied carbon becomes far more significant in relation to your operational carbon, which is not the case in South Africa right now. So just to give you a feel for action at a GBC or a Green Building Council level and on a global scale that, you know, um, you've got over 27 GBCs that are are participating in the advancing net zero program. There are 17 councils, including the GBCSA, that have actually got schemes um, and have got projects that have come through and have actually demonstrated that they are net zero. Um, and there are several signatories that have signed up, and they are typically corporates, so that, that, that number 95, um, that have you know signed up to being net zero. And I'm sure that many of you have come across um, you know, corporate players within your space that have signed up to net zero targets. And that's just a demonstration of, um, you can see the countries in blue are countries that are participating in, in the advancing net zero. And so they're actively trying to move and support as a not, you know, not for profit, support different stakeholders and, and hold different conversations to further the net zero um, agenda. In terms of impact, once again, we're talking about action from a certification perspective, we are <clears throat> we we believe strongly in the fact that if it is green and that if it is sustainable, it should be significant enough that you can actually quantify it, and that that quantification is, is measurable, it's significant, and it actually makes a different difference. And so, um, you know, this is 
We've certified over 650 buildings actually in South Africa since the GVCSA's inception in, in 2010. And they range across typologies. Um, and this summarizes the quantitative impacts um, for the built environment. Um, so just a summary slide there. And then the ridge um, in Cape Town, which you can see it's the image at the bottom. It got a six star and it was kind of designed like a lung. And I think, you know, as part of the net zero conversation, a really important building because they have um, looked at mixed mode ventilation and, and really considered what are the options for, for natural ventilation. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm, and I, I haven't had a, a quick run through to see who's on the call, we've got some really experienced green building co um, consultants, but for those of you who are not aware, certification is in effect a stamp. It says, yes, you're claiming that your building is green, um, but, you know, have it verified by somebody who's independent and let them independently assess it and then assure the market that the claims that you have made are true because, you know, it's to prevent greenwashing, in effect, um, from happening. And just so that we're clear about jargon, um, I, I just wanted to say that you can imagine that different stages in a building's life cycle require different environmental focus areas. So for example, a building that's existing, you're not really going to spend a lot of time on the structural materiality, for example, like the, the, um, the uh, concrete and obviously the steel, because you know that is it's, there's not much you can do about it. But you are going to look at um, energy and water performance and how behavior informs that, because that is something within your scope of that building. So we have different rating tools and certification options that speak to different stages in a in a building's life cycle and of relevance today would be the options that that look at net zero and that's really not to so much talk about the tool but to share um how the market has been transformed and and, and share the success stories um from that market transformation so what is net zero um you know obviously you know with the rise of um, a lot of countries' commitments to the Paris Agreement. Um, a lot of designers and, and many professionals within the built environment started realizing that it's not enough just to do things, you know, slightly differently. We, we actually have to be a bit more radical in our approach to how we design, and we we need to neutralize the impact of a building. Um, and the the thinking behind net zero is to reward projects that either mitigate the impact or that actually positively give back. They produce more energy than what they consume. Um, so the GPCSA was one of the first green building councils in the world. Um, I think we were the second or the third, um, but you know, to have a very comprehensive, we developed it um, in-house at the time. Um, certification scheme. And I think what's really great about the GBCSA's concept and thinking around um, net zero is we appreciate that it, it relates to carbon, but we've also highlighted that equally important is net zero when it comes to water, net zero when it comes to waste. And, and I think we're the only, we're still the only GBC in the world that, that um, includes this is let's think about both net zero and more importantly net positive when we think about ecology and biodiversity. So I'm going to kind of go through all of these. Um, oh, just, just to mention, obviously, for those of you who are familiar with um, EDGE certification, if that is maybe uh, particularly within a, um, an African context, EDGE also offers um, net zero after you've achieved you know, your standard EDGE certification and um, EDGE advanced. So, so that's also um, a possibility. But I mean, so, so in terms of net zero and where we are involved as a stakeholder and where we get involved in conversations, um, I've mentioned certification, I've also mentioned training, but really um, our passion lies in the advocacy role and how we can raise awareness and how we can collaborate with partners to host and facilitate um, interesting and relevant conversations around the subject. Okay, so let's so let's think a little bit about net zero and, and what it is. So as, as an overview um, that would be applicable to any of the resource categories, um, one needs to consider that there are different scopes for a building's life cycle. Um, 
and I'll go into that in a, in a bit more detail. And when you, but, but what is important to understand there, and if you're working on a project or if you're advising a client, is you've got to be quite clear about your boundary, you know, where, which parts of your building's life cycle are you trying to achieve net zero? Is it across the whole life cycle, which is wonderful, and that's obviously where we're aiming for. Um, but, and that's why I actually titled the, the talk, um, the, you know, the GBCSA's journey. And I think that, that is, is really the most important thing to understand about net zero is, is that it is a journey. You, you start and you know where the end point is, but you've got to take small steps to get there. So it's not just one, one giant leap. Um, it's about getting the building blocks right first um, and gearing yourself up to be net zero. Um, you know, when you look at your whole, when you look at your whole um, building portfolio or stock. Um, and then the thinking behind, you know, promoting market transformation um, was offering different ways for projects to demonstrate and think about being net zero. So for example, you can model a building as net zero. So that gives projects the opportunity when they're designing their building to say, let's, let's make sure that this blueprint this design of this building, the intent is that it is capable of being net zero. And that's where we draw a line on the sand and say, yes, it's modeled as net zero. But then obviously the building becomes operational and people actually live in it and, or people work in the building and you've got a facilities manager, you're leaving lights on in the, you know, in the evening. Then you then need to demonstrate within an operational phase of the building that it is also operating at net zero. So, you know, there's that continued, um, striving for net zero um, through the different stages of a building's life cycle. And very importantly, and this is true for both, you know, the GBCSA, but I mean, I, I sit in a lot of the meetings um, with our advancing net zero uh, conversations, and this is true for all um, schemes across, you know, across the world and within Africa, and as a principle, as, as a, you know, first principle when you're thinking about net zero, is you want to make sure that you have optimized the efficiency, whether it's you know carbon or whether energy or whether it's water, um, on your site first before you resort to any alternative supply solutions. And so I've used carbon here as an example. But in effect, what we don't want is highly inefficient buildings that, and I know and this is obviously not the norm right now, but what we don't want is highly efficient buildings that are just potentially throwing a lot of PV at the building achieve net zero. We want to optimize our, our efficiency, then try and generate on-site renewables. You have many situations, particularly within urban environments and high-rise buildings, um, you know, and obviously within kind of congested African cities where your building form will never be able to generate enough PV for the building, um, you know, for the building's needs. And that's, you know, typical, you know, high-rise um, high blocks. So then you would have to resort to off-site renewables, which is totally fine. And then in some cases, and that's a function of, you know, the city's kind of, um, the city and the country's um, grid mix and the ability to procure renewables, you can then also resort to carbon offsets, which have to be disclosed. So that, that there's transparency around that. Um, and, then, and then just back to the, you know, understanding those different levels, so typically we are looking at whether your just your base build is net zero. Then you add your tenant, which is level two. Then you look at your embodied carbon. Then you can look at your renovation carbon, and then you and then you can look at deep at um, you know, obviously when you demolish or deconstruct a building. But right now the focus really is on level one and level two. And it's not to say that the others are not in our radar or of concern, they are of equal concern. But it's about understanding where the greatest traction and the greatest knowledge um, and ability to influence change um, is positioned right now. So that's what a, um, a net zero certificate looks like, just so that you understand. And um, if you've ever seen one before, you know it will indicate which level has been um, achieved. It will also disclose and be transparent, as I mentioned, about the amount of offsets that have been purchased. Um, just so that if you see this, you recognize it and, and you understand what it is. So in, in terms of um, net zero and net positive certifications to date, 
um, within South Africa. We don't have any, um, although we have certified within the broader African continent, we don't have any net zero uh, projects within Africa yet, um, but we have certified 18 um, and there are net positive certifications within the, the categories of carbon, waste and um, ecology. So I just wanted to touch on a quick intro and I'm just double checking the time um, to each of these. Um, so let's start with carbon. So really a net zero um, carbon building is one that is highly energy efficient and the remaining energy uses from renewable energy. And this is the important part so that there are zero net carbon emissions on an annual basis or if the energy from renewable energy results in more energy being produced than what is used on site. A common mistake and confusion that some people um, you know, uh, interpret from this is that your building has to be off grid in order to be net zero. That is not the case. Um, and one also needs to understand that the grid, the grid actually has an important role to play in um, the stability of energy supply and also um, sharing energy. So, you know, that's not necessarily the, the end goal. It's about saying I'm consuming this much carbon, but I'm also producing this much. So I'm mitigating um, or neutralizing my impact. Um, one can see that typically it's base bills that are being modeled. Um, and so we do need to get to a point and kind of move the market where we're getting more measured data for net zero that's coming through. As an example of a building that has been net zero carbon certified, it's an industrial project, which I wanted to use in this, as an example, um, because you know it's about understanding that there's obviously immense roof space that can um, you know accommodate for PV and and meet you know sufficiently meet um, the energy demand, but just highlighting the role that industrial plays in potentially generating excess energy that can then be shared. Um, all of the um, projects that I'm mentioning today, the case studies are available on the GBCSA website, and I can also share um, the links with the um, Rise Africa campaign and um, to share with everybody who's listening today. Here's another example. It's called Too Damn Sustainable. Um, it is, th this project is off the grid. It's powered mostly by renewable energy. There's even very small micro hydro and then the, um, the carbon offsets, it was the certificate that I showed you earlier, speaks to the um, LPG generator that is required, obviously, because it's got a hospitality element in terms of, um, you know, being able to cook your food. Um, so in terms of, so let's move on to water. So a net zero um, water certification is achieved when a building is designed, constructed and operated to greatly reduce total water consumption and then use harvested, recycled and reused water, such that the amount of water consumed is the same as the amount of water that is produced. Here's an example of a net zero water project in Cape Town. Some of you might recognize it. Um, the building is called The District. There are about 700 people who work in this building. Um, and in effect, a reverse osmosis plant was used um, to purify the water from the basement seepage to achieve net zero water status. In terms of waste, it's really about understanding whether it's a construction site or whether it's an existing site and we offer um, and we appreciate and, and acknowledge that we want to try and aim for net zero within both of those contexts, but it's about making sure that no waste goes to landfill, that's when you achieve net zero, or if either your construction project or your existing site diverts waste from another site away from landfill, you can then achieve net positive. Um, and this is a really fabulous project. And why I love it is because it's actually measured data. So this is not something um, that's been modeled. This is the Wild Coast Sun, you know, obviously a big um, development, you know, it's got a lot of hospitality, there are offices, there are um, educational facilities. And so you've got many different buildings with many different uses that all produce their own waste streams. I actually think waste is, is really complex to achieve um, net zero. And on top of that, you have hotel guests who you, whose waste output you actually can't control. Um, and uh, the waste service provider really spent time, really spent a lot of detailed time with the Wild Coast Sun to unpack all the waste streams and then understand how they could upscale 
and sorry, upcycle the waste so that it becomes useful to the community and whether that was looking at organic waste and making compost that could then be used for food, you know, that fed the hotel, to looking at um, bricks that could be developed, but it, it was a great project in terms of um, achieving net zero waste from a measured perspective, and I think it was really commendable. And then when we look at ecology, it's, it, the concept is really quite simple. It's about saying, this is, if you look at a before and an after photo of your site, are you making sure that the ecology stays the same for a greenfield site? So for example, if development is on a greenfield site, you need to demonstrate that you have put back the same amount of ecology that you might have had to remove from you know, construction activities, or if it's an existing site, have you added more? And this is about bringing biodiversity ecology back into our built environment and, and being rewarded for that. Um, and this is a really great project. It's small in scale, so it's not a huge scale. But this used to be, this is the Vodafone Innovation um, site, and it used to be a, a, a car parking uh, site. I mean, so it was tarmac. Um, but they have added 70, so 70% 70 of the site has been planted with um, indigenous and endemic vegetation. And there's even a little wetland, I mean, it's small, but it's obviously used to process some of the grey water and allows for additional biodiversity within the site because, you know, uh, things are allowed to come live in it. So I think that that's a nice example of ecology, but we obviously want to increase the scale. So maybe just to touch on some drivers, and I'm conscious of time, um, Mark, so I'm almost done, um, but, but, you know, this is just to familiarise everybody with some of the conversations that are happening and and if you would like to be more involved or if you would you know, like to contact any of these stakeholders, I can always put you in touch. So, you know, a key driver is our, the update to our SANS 10400XA legislation that, that regulates how buildings are built. You need to get this type of building approval in order to build your building. Um, and the energy consumption figures have been increased so you know the hope behind that is that it is going to drive improved performance we tested our um our green buildings and um the vast majority well i mean the, the average does fall under the limit um but it still demonstrates that even for green buildings it is going to be built it is going to be moving the metric for some which means that you know from a from the broader market perspective um, this is definitely going to be driving market transformation um and as I've explained, you know, because energy efficiency is so vital to achieving net zero, this is a significant piece of legislation. For those of you who don't know, our EPCs have been gazetted. It happened at the end of last year before we, before we all went on holiday. Um, but in effect, by I think it's the 8th of December 2022, certain um, classes and it applies to offices, schools, places of worship and um, places of public gathering and kind of like indoor sports um, <clears throat> buildings uh, for it's it's for um, private sector that's over 2000 square meters and for government buildings that are over a thousand square meters they are legally obliged to display an energy performance certificate which will judge their operational energy to the SANS benchmarks so it's not a perfect comparison but it was, the, it was the best place to start. And this is really important in terms of kind of legislating um, and making energy performance transparent. So, you know, it's that first step to, to managing um, emissions. Um, I see that there are some um, listeners on the call today who, who are very familiar with this, but for those of you who don't know, there was a South African buildings program. It was, um, uh, initiated by C40s, but all of our major metros participated. And this was, you know, a three-year program. You know, I think it was an incredibly successful program. The goal and the aim was to develop whatever was, you know, appropriate to the city, whether it be a bylaw or a policy, but something that in effect, from a regulatory perspective, promotes, drives, enhances, and um, supports the building approval process to reaching this 2030 all new build 20 you know all new builds need to be 2030 or net zero by 2030 it was there to support that goal 
um, that I mentioned earlier from the from the World Green Building Council. Um, and um, I've noticed the source there, and I'll drop the link in in the chat box to share with all of you. But I think one of the key success factors of this program is coming out with energy use intensities um, that can guide what our targets need to be between now and 2050. So it's, you know, it's about giving a roadmap, saying where are we going, what do we need to aim for to reach the targets that we want to go for. Um, and really, each one of the cities had a dedicated technical um, officer that championed um, this in their relevant departments and all four cities, and I checked in with them last week, but I, you know, I don't have enough time to, to go through each one of their kind of updates, but they are all in various processes of either um, approving, uh, they're all in the final stages of approving either policies or bylaws that are going to support um, this net zero goal. Um, just to share, the GBCSA partnered and collaborated with um, the City of Cape Town um, on the My Clean Green Home campaign, which was really fun. It was a student competition and the students had to design um, a net zero home, which actually even in spite of COVID got built. Um, we went to go and see it in, uh, uh, was put up in um, the Greenpoint Park and it was great. And there's actually a virtual tour and I'll also um, share the link. So go and have a look at it. It was a really fun and interesting project. I would recommend um, having a look at the virtual tour. In terms of resources that are available <coughs> as part of the um, new buildings program, the GBCSA, um, also supported an initiative in terms of getting technical resources out there to help people who are new to the net zero um, language, terminology, um, and, and kind of principles and ideas with a technical guide of how to get to net zero. And I would recommend that you read it. Um, we are also following on from that, having two sessions, I think it's the 2nd of June and the 7th of July, where we are actually looking at how we can map the modeling requirements to our trajectory. So they're going to be quite technical, but I think they're going to be very, very interesting. Attendance is free of charge, so I'd encourage you to, to sign up for that. Um, and then another great resource is the Smart Buildings Hub. I've popped the, the website there, but I'll also pop it in the chat box. Um, and, this, and this was a, a product of the uh, C14 New Buildings Program, but it's got all of, you know, each one of the individual um, cities progression on there, and it's got loads of great resources. And as part of that, there's also another podcast session. There's one on, on, on Friday, on, on Thursday, sorry. And I have put the details here, which is about transformation and really going through this program. But also, you know, it's bringing so many stakeholders together. There's so many layers um, to get right in order to have a very consolidated movement in the right direction. And I, and I think that the program has been very successful in, um, in moving this conversation forward. From my personal perspective, and maybe just to touch off as a um, kind of jump into um, Mark's architectural focus, you know, the things I think we need to get right really is understanding our, our appetite for glazing and, and what we think of as a beautiful building um, and whether that is, you know, a glass box. And then the design and um, kind of feedback loops from how people use buildings in relation to thermal comfort and natural ventilation are, are vital for the net zero challenge from a technical perspective um, to get right. Um, I would be remiss without um, informing you about our convention, which really I think is the kind of sustainability and green building event of the year. We have fabulous speakers, very topical. Uh, we obviously, we, we, we launched it last year and we had a whole virtual um, session and it you know went off really well. And, and so we're offering uh, a virtual conference this year as well, but you can also attend in person. So check that out if you're keen. Um, and if you're interested in networking and meeting like-minded people, um, the quality of delegates is really um, commendable. And so that's it for me. Thank you very much. I've popped my, my details here, um, but I'm going to drop the links that I mentioned into the, into the chat function. Um, and you can also head over to our website if you want to find out more, but I'm going to hand over to Mark now. Um, he's got some really really interesting detail to share with you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Georgina. Um, I think you need to stop sharing so I can start sharing. There we go. All right. Let's get my 
lights up. All right, so that was, yeah, that was really good. Thanks, Georgina, for that um, intro. So what I'm going to take you through is really um, our firm was the first to design a triple net zero building um, on the continent. So I'm going to take you almost into the kitchen, uh, the back house of, of how do you design net zero and how do you apply that to kind of real African problems. Um, I'm going to take a step back just in terms of what Georgina shared and just give you a bit more understanding around where the planet is at. Um, this is a, a diagram that's been done by Kate Rathworth. She's an economist. Um, it's called the donut model. And basically it's showing the planet's ecological ceiling. So we, we see so much bombardment uh, from the news, you know, David Attenborough, all these people saying the planet is in this, you know, crisis, but where do we actually start? So this is a nice diagram that shows areas, these red areas are the things that have actually crossed the ecological ceiling in terms of planetary health. Um, and so these are your starting points when it comes to looking at where do we start? Climate change, biodiversity loss, land conversion, um, nit nitrogen ph phosphorus loading, that's kind of um, fertilizer that's related to, to farming. But what's important about that is we can't just look at the ecological side, we need to look at the social side at the same time. Um, as we know, in Africa, we've got massive social problems, social challenges, Social economic development is kind of the standard political rhetoric, rhetoric at the moment. And we need to also build social foundations but, but with, within these areas. So it's kind of these both. That's what sustainability move, means for us really as a firm. Um, and sustainability now these days means so many things. But we've kind of taken that, that donut model and, and summarized it into a sentence that says, you know, sustainability means humankind's responsibility to live within the ecological capacity of the planet as well as securing health, economic freedom, and social equity for all people. And I think that's, that needs to be very clear from the beginning. Our mission statement as a company kind of comes out of that, which is reversing local extinction through sustainable architecture. So let's just talk about carbon. As Georgina has mentioned, um, carbon is really talking about carbon emissions. Uh, as we know, the, the world is getting is hotter. This is the IP. CC report, which I'm sure you've read, but it's kind of looking at 1960s, where was our temperature, how it's increased in 2017, where it's projected, and there's a whole lot of different routes for us to get down to, to zero. Um, and that's what carbon, that's what the word carbon is related to, um, net zero carbon. It's talking about carbon um, dioxide emissions, and obviously the other related greenhouse gases, which you have methane and nitrous oxide and other things. Um, Georgina has spoken about this, but kind of the difference between a one degree, which is where we are here, and a 1.5 and a two degrees extensive, and the effect on ecological systems, which is really our life support system of the planet, is significant when you move over the 1.5 mark. So in the, in the back of your mind, keep this 1.5 mark as kind of a, uh, a level that we're aiming at that's, that's kind of really important. I know some of these things might be scary. This is a presentation that's trying to give you a bit of hope. You know, we've done um, kind of stuff around um, ocean warming in, in Australia's Great Barrier Reef to kind of help um, coral reefs grow. So there is lots of work. People are coming together around the world to bring these solutions together. So be scared on one side, but be excited and hopeful on the other side. Um, this is just specifically climate change relating to sub-Saharan so Africa of the next 100 years. So you're looking at about a five degree increase over places like Namibia and Botswana. And some places are increasing in rainfall, as you can see Lesotho, um, places in Mozambique, um, Tanzania, Kenya, and, and other places are, are reducing rainfall. So we, we're pretty much getting hotter everywhere and, and some places are getting wetter or drier. What, is, what have countries started to do in terms of the African context? This is a, a great website if you want to just log on and check how your country is doing. Um, it's called the Climate Action Plan or Climate Action Tracker. Um, and they kind of rate each country's formal policies against getting to zero. So this is South Africa's kind of projection. We are a pretty developed nation, industrialized nation. And so we kind of need to almost de-industrialize as we get down. And unfortunately, our, our current plans are, are what are kind of leading to a, a four degree warmer world and, and um, climate action track kind of rates South Africa as highly inefficient when it comes to, to our climate action plans. We either have to do a lot now in the early stages, or we're going to have to kind of have this very slow decline and then do something very extreme at 2050. And you can see these kind of goals 2020, 2030 and 2050 being things that you know, cities and corporates and governments have started to take on board. 
Morocco is probably our best case scenario in terms of Africa. Um, and a lot of African countries, you know, aren't as developed. So you'll see their lines almost need to kind of plateau and then decrease. But they are looking at a kind of 1.5 degree, which is comparable comparable with the Paris Agreement. Um, so there is hope in Africa um, and hopefully we can take kind of a leadership position noting how, you know, how explosive our cities will be growing in the next kind of 20 years. This is just looking at uh, South Africa and looking at our greenhouse gas emissions specifically, what kind of industries are they within? You can see energy in terms of South Africa's greenhouse gas emissions is kind of 80 to 83 percent. But also what Georgina mentioned is about half of that energy is used directly within buildings. So buildings have such a super important role to play when it comes to reducing this massive energy load, almost the downstream load of what we need to then offset with renewables as we, knew, as, as we kind of move towards net zero carbon. So that's important to note. Some people are, you know, even governments are looking at their big overall energy spend, and that's a mistake. Let's first try to get it as efficient as possible, especially with our buildings at large scale, and then we can look at big scale technologies like renewables. And again, as most you know, most of you know, if you if you live in Africa, uh, our cities are are growing um, very very quickly. Um, Asia is kind of going through its growth spurt at the moment. You can see kind of China and India, kind of twenty thirty are kind of peaking. And then it's really Africa. Most of the new cities are going to be built in Africa um, for 2040 to 2060. And so we've got this chance really to, to learn from the developed world, uh, but not make the same mistakes as they did uh, in terms of the way that in which they developed. And I think we could really show that most of the green cities in the world could be built in Africa. And that's really what we're quite excited about as a firm. So we're just going to double click, as the, as the youth say these days, um, on each of these categories and really re-justify why did the GBCSA look at these four categories and not others. Water, as we know, is crucial. Uh, you know, most of South African or African um, uh, countries are, are based on kind of agriculture. And so we're seeing this change in climate having a direct effect in our food security. And that's really important to note. As we know, climate change brings, brings less water, but sometimes it brings more water. And we know there's, there's, there's stories that we know across the continent of, of flooding. And buildings still use a significant amount of water, 12% of all fresh water. The most majority of water is used in agriculture and also the way that we irrigate systems. Why waste? I'm sure um, you know this by now, but kind of waste has become a major problem globally. We've seen it in the ocean. Um, South Africa is actually on the list of kind of one of the top producers that sends plastic to the ocean. So we're on the list there. Nigeria is slightly uh, above us. Um, so we need to, to relook kind of uh, at waste and see it as a resource, see it as something that we can almost put back into a, a cyclical econ economy instead of having it based kind of a, a cradle to grave approach to, to packaging. Uh, and buildings use 40% of all waste sent to landfill. So buildings are mass consumers of both resources and mass producers of something like waste. Ecology. Ecology is one of uh, a passion of our firm and you'll see how we think it's incredibly central to the approach of, of green buildings and greenhouse gas emissions. And, and we're very thankful to the Green Building Council of South Africa to have the tool of net zero carbon, I mean, net zero ecology that we can actually use to, to put a, an objective metric against our, our projects. This is why it's so important. So this is the greenhouse gas removals per land type in South Africa. Okay, so the zero, so look at the zero line, everything above, below the line are things that are absorbing carbon dioxide. So they're actually helping reverse global warming. So these are good things. Um, forest land, as you can see, has increased since 2000 from 20, 2000 to 2015, as well as grasslands. Those are your, those in South Africa, those are your two major carbon, what we call carbon sinks, is land that's actually absorbing carbon dioxide over time. So a big justification of us as a firm is how do we increase our carbon sinks, as well as approaching buildings from a net zero carbon point of view, which, which Georgina has already explained. So I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about ecology, um, which is something again that we're passionate about, but, you, but you're really gonna see um, the relevance of what it means for South Africa. Um, South Africa is uh, listed as the third most biodiverse country in the world. And across the continent, a, a lot of our tourism is based on the incredible biodiversity that we have as Africans. And so how do we actually use this both as a carbon sink and as 
um, a, a resilience factor in terms of protecting it for, for economies like tourism. So this is kind of your major ecosystem types in South Africa. You can see that the most critically endangered Indian coastal belt, forest and grassland are also our biggest carbon sinks. So there's a direct link between protecting these ecosystem types and um, carbon sinking capacity in terms of moving a whole country towards net zero. We as a firm, we kind of started out um, exploring sub, sub, uh, the subcontinent of Africa and really getting a taste for ourselves of where is our local communities act on the ground? Um, how are these ecosystems functioning? Um, we've, we've gone from the Okavango in Botswana. This is the Namib desert, desert in, in Namibia. And, and re we've really seen landscape change. Um, and what's happening specifically in South Africa is grasslands are changing to savanna and the Karoo biome and, 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 and biomes around the Karoo are changing to desert. And, and we've actually seen this taking place in our travels. Sustainability in the African condition is also um, some of the clues can be linked to, to how people have lived for centuries. Uh, you know, using your landscape sustainably uh, is, is actually deeply African. Um, and it's kind of, you know, you think it's an invented term from, from, from the West, but it's not. Africans have been living sustainably for, for hundreds of thousands of years. And so we go into these communities, really learn from them, provide architectural support, engineering support, but they are our real kind of inspiration uh, inspirational heroes when it comes to our work. The second thing that we look at is kind of research endemic plant species and animal species and how they've adapted to these kind of harsh climates. Um, this is a stone plant um, unique to um, the Karoo biome that, that we've studied. So we're going to take you through three uh, projects that are attempting different um, levels of NEFTA. Some have been certified, some are still in the process of, of, of kind of achieving that certification. But, but these three scales are current work that kind of, uh, kind of try and attack real African problems at the ground level. So this is, this is the Firehouse Project um, in Alexandra Township, which is the oldest township in, um, in Johannesburg. And if you know anything about South Africa's history, apartheid had a, a segregated system of, of white and kind of all other races in different areas. And Alexandra Township was one of these first areas where black people could actually buy freehold land within the city. And so it became this multicultural place and still is today. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like today. It's really informal. Most of these building structures have no kind of formal approval at all, um, but have been uh, within families for generations now. And so there's a big need in the South African context and also around Africa in terms of how do we deal with things like informal settlements? Um, where there's no planning policy, there's no infrastructure, um, and how do we support these people that have really started to move within our cities and require kind of safe housing? Like uh, other African cities, Johannesburg is, is increasing by three people an hour, and, and, you know, and that's not that much places like Kinshasa, you know, are like 30 people an hour. So you're having this mass migration in terms of African cities from rural areas into cities, and we are just simply not building housing, uh, housing fast enough to accommodate these kind of numbers. Other problems of kind of lack of infrastructure is things like fire. And this project, we really sat with the local community and they, they actually gave us this challenge of saying, if you can solve, solve fire in terms of our, our housing crisis, that would be kind of the chief challenge that we would give you. Um, and so we looked in terms of our research process, we looked at the original landscape of Johannesburg before the city came got inspiration from that by studying kind of fire resistant plant species and adapting those principles into our, our design. Um, our design is the little red block, which is pretty close to where Nelson Mandela used to, to rent a home. Um, and, you, and you can see the urban grain is really irregular, um, you know, negotiated space, courtyard space, multiple layers between um, public and private, um, really quite intricate. We did a massive research process and got to cross-laminated timber or CLT, which is a prefabricated um, material made out of um, timber and can be kind of locally assembled using cranes. Um, and it has very, very good fire resistant qualities as well as kind of thermal qualities. Uh, we also started to build an, an ecological system around the unit itself using kind of indigenous um, fruit plants like the stumpflow milk, milk plum, which is an amazing plant. You can make, you know, brandy, um, high vitamin C content and also with things like wild jasmine that kind of encourages uh, pollination by bees 
and apiculture is really using um, the commercialization of honey. Um, so trying to create economic opportunity around the building itself and using net positive carbon, which now you know is actually generating more energy than you need. How can you use that extra energy to provide um, kind of economic security for the resident? And so through a research process, again, with the community, they said, let's, let's provide Wi-Fi that clients can actually you know, connect to, and this can become a resource um, that they make money from. And obviously it's also with water, if you're harvesting more rainwater than you need, you can use that in terms of farming that can also produce um, jobs and economic security around the unit. So it's really about not talking about sustainability in the, in the, in the pure sense. It's, it's sitting down with the community and saying, this building can actually make you money. Um, that's how you can encourage things like maintenance and other things, which is really tough in kind of low um, or highly vulnerable uh, social economic communities. This is just what it looks like on the inside. The building has a fire protection system that actually protects itself from fire that is again borrowed from um, that inspirational fire resistant plant that you saw at the beginning. Another kind of uh, residential development that we've done is, is the Flayhase, uh, which was the first triple net zero rated project um, on the continent. And again, we, start, we started with the ecological system. We started with the landscape. We did research on what were the original landscapes of Johannesburg um, before kind of the city came. They would grassland, um, kopi and wetland. And on this specific site, which is quite small, we designed the whole project on the functionality of a wetland. A wetland brings two degrees pooling, which is actually the um, Johannesburg is projected to become two degrees warmer um, by 2050. So this actually brings climate resilience into kind of the fabric of, of the project by just looking at the landscaping. The architectural idea became architecture's nest. How could we build a piece of architecture like a bird does within um, a wetland system with its nest trying to kind of protect its eggs? So the, the building itself um, has a solar PV system, three kilowatt PV system. Um, it uses natural ventilation of the wetlands, moistened air that filters through the building and it gets sunlight um, through skylights, which is actually a very effective uh, mechanism in order to get light into a building. And it functions above this wetland and this wetland purifies the water um, to drinking quality. It also provides space for aquaculture, which is basically um, fish farming. Um, so you can, also be kind of net zero food if you wanted to um, on this project. And what's, what's the most difficult part of something like net zero water is your storage capacity that you need usually these, all these, all these tanks um, in order to store your rainwater. And so we kind of solve that problem also using our wetland and our wetland becomes our rainwater storaging device. Cause in Johannesburg, we get a lot of rain, but it falls in a pretty short period of time. So you need something to kind of store it in and we said you know why not use it as part of as part of the wetland um, so you'll see as you attempt net zero and net zero thinking if you can start to you know even attempt more than one rating they start to strengthen each other in this kind of journey towards net zero because you are integrating the architecture directly into its natural environment and this is what it looks like it's achieved a net positive ecology rating because all the all the species that you see here were endemic from the johannesburg biome the research that we had to do for that was quite significant. We, we took a, a, a kind of a research expedition to the Okavongo Delta in Botswana, which is arguably the, one of the most pristine wetlands in the world, um, to kind of study both, you know, vernacular people that lived in the wetland, as well as kind of the species and the ecological functioning of the wetland. Netzera carbon, which is probably your easiest to justify from an economic point of view. The payback periods are there now. Um, so, so that's pretty, pretty easy to justify. Net zero water, generally in, in, in South Africa, our water is still very cheap. So that's quite difficult to justify, but we were able to get those three ratings with kind of the benefit of, of putting the ecological system first. This is just what it looks like on the inside. Kind of still contemporary when it comes to detailing. And then we'll just, last project to share is just um, a healthcare facility. So we're just going to jump a scale um, to kind of a commercial slash um, healthcare facility kind of scale. Again, we did an extensive research process in kind of the existing uh, landscape. We found this kind of hero species uh, called the spotted arum lily. It really became um, our inspiration point for the building. And so many plants in, in Africa are used in traditional medicine, um, which, which we wanted to really celebrate in this building. 
So that became our symbol of healing that we took as inspiration for even getting getting light into a kind of a square cave, a square um, shaped building. Most of our projects we we really start with kind of handmade models, hand drawings before we go into kind of hardcore computer. And and this project is built. Uh, its main facade system is made out of PET bottles, seventy eight thousand of them. Um, and so again, this is kind of can be community made, which is quite exciting. This is what the facade looks like. And as Georgina spoke, spoke about, we as architects, we love our glass. Um, it's fantastic when it comes to kind of light and view, but it has very poor thermal performance by itself. And generally your high performance energy um, glass is, is very expensive. And basically all it is, is having a kind of this sophisticated plastic layer between two, two layers of glass. So we said, let's take that plastic layer out. Let's put it on the outside as our kind of solar shading. So we can still have glass on the inside. But this is almost half the cost of what you'd have for a sophisticated um, glazing system. And we think it's, it's quite beautiful. And obviously, we can, we're taking bottles that would have gone to landfill um, and using them in a different way. The project um, moved forward to also become kind of a symbol of, of um, monitoring air pollution. So we've got air pollution monitoring sensors within the bottles as well as a lighting system at night. So the building actually changes color depending on the outdoor air pollution from kind of a white if the air is clean to um, kind of a red if the, if the air is polluted. And it's kind of looking at uh, mainly pollution from, from transport. So things like carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, um, carbon dioxide. So I think a lot of these things, people aren't aware. And so there needs to be an education process, you know, with us talking about pollution and talking about sustainability. And so we thought this was quite a poetic way to do that, both the hospital, like the plant, actually, you know, being a symbol of, of healing um, and a symbol of, of purification within its context. This is what the inside looks like. We use the well building standard, which is your kind of your, your most difficult rating when it comes to talking about, um, to achieve when it comes to, to, to people's health. It really talks about the health. It's got kind of peer reviewed science behind um, that rating system. And it's a great weight rating system for healthcare facilities. So we use that kind of as a starting point. And, and this project is, is attempting a net zero carbon um, rating. It'll be the first healthcare facility to do that in South Africa. This is kind of the bottle facade, as you saw at the inside. So getting in great natural light, which we want, uh, but also giving a sense of privacy when it comes to views out, uh, but also removing that heat load that glass gives um, when the sun hits it. And then green roofs, you know, again, bringing in kind of the indigenous landscape. We didn't have space to do that on ground floor, but actually bringing that onto the roof context um, in terms of indigenous landscaping that becomes a part of the healing space in terms of things like physio and other things um, that you need rehabilitation for. And then this is my last slide. I think a lot of us, especially kind of my training at university back in the day, uh, was kind of focusing on best case scenarios, best precedents happening in, in the Western world. And, and I think we have a lot to learn um, from the West, but this is a really interesting diagram that, that has been adapted in terms of understanding the worldview of, of the San. And the, and the San in, in, in his book, um, Affluence Without Abundance, which I encourage you to read from, from James Sisman, he's an anthropologist that goes into the San and actually argues that they're, they're probably the most successful civilization in the world because they've been able to sustain their culture for the longest period of time. Um, and so what do we actually define success as these days? Um, I would think it would be about sustainability, meaning you can actually do this thing forever. Um, and, and that's what the San have been able to do. And how have they been able to do that? This is kind of the, a diagram kind of des describing the worldview of the San. Their community is based around water, as you can see in the middle. They've got a camp in which they live that is net zero carbon. And I've kind of superimposed the, the, the three net zero um, categories on this. And their ecological system is their hunting ground, which provides all their medicine and all their food. So just to give context of that, the sand live, live off about 120 different plant species, um, obviously with, 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 a, with a little bit of amount of meat, kind of a plant-rich diet. And they work two to three days a week to be able to provide everything they need for their family's needs. So think about that. Kind of, that's like you know, the ultimate, you know, work two days a week. Imagine what you could do for the rest of your time if you only had to work two days a week. And then I've superimposed just personal dreams and governing authority over sky and underworld. The San have a deeply spiritual um, kind of worldview system that relates to the sky and the underworld. 
So thank you. Let me just end there and thank you for your time. Stop sharing and see. Just open the floors. If there's any questions, if we can go back to you know any slides, let us know. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time and and let's open the floor to to questions. Thanks, Mark. That was great, as always. Um, I I did have a look through the um, chat function for any questions that have come through, but there were none. <laughs> Might be a bit late in the day for all of you. <laughs> Um, uh, Barbara sent through um, a comment um, around um, an organization that supports hospitals, which sounds interesting, but there weren't any questions unless I've missed them. Jess, is there anything, uh, yeah, well, I mean, just, just give us a shot if there's anything we missed. So I know this might be information overload. I remember when I first got into this industry, all these terms freaked me out. So really do not be shy if there's anything that we've been unclear about. I think the most important part is the definitions for me because you'll hear people say things like carbon neutrality, net zero, and all these things mean different things. So I think it's important to understand the differences. And, and when you hear net zero, it's mostly speaking about carbon, like Georgina mentioned, like the whole world is talking about carbon. But hopefully we've you know, kind of convinced you of the other three categories and how necessary they are um within just the, the, the african condition i feel like if we're only looking at carbon there's a great missed opportunity in terms of you know what we can do as as a continent together mm, definitely and i think it's also important to know which which stage in the life cycle you're referring to and, and so most references would be like i said to the operational phase um but you know keeping keeping in mind that obviously we want to also improve our performance on the embodied carbon stage. And we're actually doing some research um, in the city of Johannesburg um, around what types of urban forms <clears throat> are more beneficial in terms of what kind of carbon trajectory they lock the city into you know, for the long term. The results are not published yet. They'll hopefully be published in the next month or two. <laughs> um, but we'll be able to share that as well. So. Okay, so Mark, I see there's a question for you. Should I read it out? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Mark. This is from Dirishna Gavinder. Hi, Mark. How feasible was it to collect and use all the plastic bottles? Do you believe that this can be incorporated as a common material? It's so cool, but I'm always worried that we cannot get these options to work on a mass scale. So that's a good question. Um, basically, what we had to do the first, the first person to convince was the client um, because, you know, ideas, they don't come across radical for us, but they, they come across radical for clients. So I think the most important thing to justify is that it's got a very specific engineering role. And, and, and I think that was our starting point. So we use quite sophisticated um, computer modeling to make sure that the designs that we design will actually perform. And we were able to prove that um, through that computer modeling system to say, you know, this has actually got really good performance when it comes to our glazing. So basically what we have is we've got full scale glazing, um, double glazing, but it's, but it's clear. There's no performance coating on it. And our bottles become our, our sun shading device. So that was our first thing to justify. Um, the second thing was it's pretty easy to get PET bottles. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the waste recyclers that we're on site, which in, in the South African context, we, it's kind of quite an informal market. Um, these guys, you know, you, they're getting charged almost nothing for, for these bottles. So that was pretty easy for us to do. Um, the, the difficulty was really around, I think, the assembly process. So there we had to involve the local community, we got the local school involved, local church involved. Um, and we saw that as a positive thing. You know, a, a building like this is a lot of money for a client to spend and they really needed to be accepted by the community. And, and that was a way that we used to kind of infiltrate that and, and get that positive thinking. Um, I don't know, did I answer, did I mm. answer all the, the questions I worried about working on a mass scale? So I think I think the mass scale is, is almost a separate argument. I would say that it's still a new material because uh, we did a lot of research before on, on plastics in general and, and plastics obviously being so common and, and obviously building materials being 
that are so resource heavy, there's almost there's there's almost a you know a no brainer to connect recycled and ups and upcycled plastics into building materials. But there needs to be this precedent, which I hope this project this project will showcase a precedent project that shows how it actually can be done in a professional point of view. And then you've got a whole lot of other regulations, things like fire and other things which we also had to solve at the same time. So I'm happy to 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 have you know um, is it governor Darisha um, a, a conversation you know even I'll drop my email and we can take the conversation further if I'm if I'm not answering your question. Mm. No Mark I, I think you have and I think maybe just to add it's also because Darisha that's an important question because typically from a materiality perspective I would say as a generalization you, you would have more resistance in comparison to when you're suggesting ideas for energy or for water. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, and, and I am generalizing here, I'm not saying that there's no innovation and, and that we don't have great examples, but, but in comparison to energy and water, I think that there is less um, kind of uh, innovation at a building scale. Um, and sometimes it's because you can't very easily demonstrate the business case. But I think you know what is important is getting the client and your team on board because I think it speaks to quite an integrated design process and thinking about what your options are. It's not just about you know a copy and paste from what happened on the last project. So I think the design process and the design approach, and that's typically kind of you know from the onset of a project, significantly influences alternative um, you know choices of materials. I think Georgina, your point is important because. People think about efficiency as changing some light bulbs, and that is efficiency. But when you're designing a new building, the biggest efficiency is your building fabric. So that's the materials that you're using. How big are your glass panels? Are you even using glass? And so, and so for us, you know, and that requires, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, even in South Africa, the green building consultants come in after the building has been designed. And that's why, unfortunately, it becomes just, let's put some PV on the roof. And, and, and we wanted to go back to the basics and say, let's, let's look at materials and even new, new materials in the African sense of what we could, could use within buildings. And I think that's crucial um, to understand. But you need a client that has the money and the appetite because, like I said, there is an element of risk when it comes to, to not having these precedent buildings up yet. But again, that's where you use something like you know, computer modeling to be able to prove to the client actually this will perform and you can trust us as professionals taking responsibility over that. Hmm. Okay, there's another question from you, Anita. Um, most, so thank you for the presentation. Most of the examples or models relate to buildings. Are you thinking of pushing the envelope to cities if you have not um, yet already? That's a I mean, great question. Um, we, I think, stay on. I think I am I'm speaking in another sh a session called um, Share. Sharing, sharing, developing shared public spaces um, with the city of Joburg. So that's, we're gonna be looking at parks and you'll see how we approach kind of net positive ecology in parks um, and transportation systems. Um, we, we've got kind of experience in that as well. And then if you are looking for the kind of the most extreme stuff, we're looking at um, some of the projects we're designing now are looking at um, new wildlife migration routes um, that start to connect through cities and how even bringing back something like an elephant migration can improve things like food security and reverse global warming. So I won't give too much information on that. Um, you're welcome to kind of follow our social media pages and others to see more information on those projects. But yes, you can't just look at the building. You have to be looking at the whole city as, as a whole. There is missing research within that. Um, our company is part of kind of developing an ecological regeneration plan for the whole city of Johannesburg. And I think African cities should be thinking about that. But the, this, that, is, that is early stages. At the moment, we're kind of um, moving one step at a time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you need to, everyone acknowledges that, you know, at a building scale, <clears throat> it's great to achieve things, but you, you need sustainable planning, you need integrated planning. And, you know, once you have kind of site-wide solutions or, or precinct-led kind of solutions, they invariably typically afford efficiencies as well so you know i think that that's the kind of goal that everybody's moving towards and and there is a growing awareness you know around that i mean that, and in terms of our professionals i think that our planners our town planners any of our built environment professionals are kind of um 
well versed in, in the principles of sustainable design. And I think it's more around the challenges of when you actually practice, <clears throat> how do you overcome some of the barriers um, that prevent you from implementing that. But I mean, and also from a GVCSA's perspective, um, we've got a sustainable precincts tool that really looks at you know, integrated design and um, any of these concepts in terms of the net zero principles would apply to a city level. And then obviously, you know, what's important from the city level is that you then need to start taking transport emissions and, and that's, you know, massive. So definitely. Um, okay, here's a question from Miguel. Um, and Mark, I'm gonna see if you can answer this. Do you use some program simulation to test performance? Yeah, so I saw that. I've just typed in the chat. Um, so the, there's two, the, depending on your country, I don't know where you are, Miguel, but in terms of South Africa, there's two certified um, computer modeling softwares. One's called IES, the other one's called Design Builder. Um, so you're welcome to Google those software types and kind of get familiar with them. Um, there is a, you know, if you're thinking about learning the software, there is a definite need in the industry uh, to learn software like that as we move buildings towards kind of net zero, because you want to be able, even with existing buildings, you want to be able to model the building first to see where is it failing from an efficiency point of view before you actually recommend measures. Um, so there's a great need to, to know that software. And hopefully even when you submit to councils, you'll be able to, the councils will be able to accept your, your thermal performance model, um, not just kind of 2D calculations, um, which become pretty, you know, pretty frustrating after a while. Yeah, I think Miguel, so before I joined the, the Green Building Council, I worked for an engineering firm as a, as a green building consultant. And I think that the role of um, simulation and modeling in your optioneering stage with your client, I mean, and, and Mark, you could see from um, his presentation, you know, what the, what the outputs and what the effects were. I think it's vital because I think it, they are in effect the tools that allow you to say, let's try this and let's, let's do you know, these shading options and what's the energy impact, what's the daylight impact, what's the thermal comfort impact. Um, and that gives a lot of freedom. It gives a project team the tools um, to really fine tune um, the options that they have to balance, you know, aesthetics with internal performance. So yes, definitely very important, I think, from a, from a green building design perspective. Um, okay, we've got a nice question here from Shonello. How can we spread awareness and encourage people or businesses to go green, achieve net zero? Um, so I think, I mean, I've, I've, I don't mind starting more from like an institutional industry body perspective and then Mark, if you wanna kind of chat about how um, you engage with clients. Um, so I think the first thing is having conversations like this. So it's really about raising awareness um, and that's raising awareness um, in, with new audiences, um, you know, and kind of collaborating with new and, and maybe unlikely partners so that you kind of spread the message beyond um, to who you typically speak to. Um, I think it's about demonstrating, particularly within a business situation, what the, um, you know, what the value is. And right now and we're seeing it particularly from an investor's perspective uh, within ESG and risk and investment risk kind of conversations the question is, is your business going to be continue? Will your business be able to continue if you don't consider these issues? So for example, when we think about the drought, once again, in Cape Town, there were some offices, I mean, when your offices, you know, close because it doesn't have fresh water, I think it's for 48 hours, you have to close your offices down. So in terms of business continuity and future proofing your business against risk, it's a massive imperative for businesses to be considering net zero. Just purely in terms of how their business will be able to continue in the light of, you know, supply shortages or, you know, other types of risks. If you think about kind of um, increased temperatures and what that means for people in, you know, in a building. So the, the question sometimes to ask is not, you know, why should you go green? It's, well, what's going to happen if you don't go green in 10 years time? And it, is a, it is a long term view so you know it doesn't it doesn't often speak to kind of short-term interest but i think that that's often key in um promoting that switch mark do you have any thoughts you want to add yeah it's a hard one i feel like i don't have conversations initially about the morality of green or the ethics of green 
it's a financial conversation because unfortunately us as Africans, we don't have a lot of money like in general, you know, and it's, and it's, and we've got to be very smart with the money we do have. So generally it's around a, a financial conversation. That's most of our clients. And then secondly, it's a, it's a marketing thing. You know, it's, 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 you know, green has become a status symbol. I might not like it, but let's use it to our advantage. And the more companies that we can say that are going green in the real definition of the word, as you can see with what Georgina has presented, the better, you know, I'm not really interested in the intention behind it. I'm interested in transformation. And we in such an early stage that we almost need all the help we can get. Um, the second thing is start with yourself. I, you know, I think, you know, even me and my, my own family, like thinking about the waste we, we generate and the water we generate, we trying to help even the complex, the residential complex we live in to move towards um, net zero, giving them a net zero vision of saying, we want to be net zero as a complex by 2030. And then you work backwards from that. But if you don't have the vision, you really don't have any way to start. Um, and I think that's, that's maybe, that's maybe, that might be helpful. It's just saying, set up a vision for your family, set up a vision for your community, um, using these terms, net zero, choose one of the four categories, choose all four if you want, and then, and then move, and then move from there. What are the little steps that we can take um, as budget allows to move us towards net zero? Okay, Mark, here's one, I think, I think there are two more questions. The one is from um, Brenton Hose. Hi, Mark, how do you see the principle of circular economics within the built environment being implemented and integrated with the conventional construction methodology and material resources? Okay, so in your precedent within Alexandria, you use CLT, but that is obviously not a readily available resource within South Africa. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, so let me just unpack it for those who, who don't understand. Maybe there's a bit of jargon then. So circular economies, that's obviously contrary to your cradle um, to grave economy, which is almost a linear process. So circular economies is looking about almost keeping a resource within a system. So, you know, even if you're producing a certain waste, that waste is becoming a resource in another system. Um, so the biggest problem, um, Brenton, obviously, as, you, as you've as you mentioned in your question or alluded in your question, is that our, our material manufacturing capacity is based on an industrialized process, which is very similar to the Western world. Um, brick, concrete and steel um, and glass is made in an industrial way, which requires a huge amount of energy. Um, Georgina spoke about the embodied energy of that. And so our construction industry in terms of materials is probably, in my opinion, the most difficult thing to change. Um, and, and the way that we've approached that is to firstly try and use as little as possible in our buildings of high embodied energy materials. Um, the worst one is, is aluminium. Um, and then you have things like glass, steel, concrete. Brick is pretty middle. And then you've got kind of natural materials like timber and thatch and other things. Um, that have a low embodied energy. Generally in a contemporary building, you use a mix of those to try and balance your embodied energy. Um, CLT, uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about this, but we are opening our first CLT factory in Peter Maritzburg pretty soon. So that will be uh, a ready-made material in South Africa, which is very exciting. But I think the, 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 the idea around CLT, it's a pretty simple material um, when it comes to it. It's just, it's just made in a really, really cool way that gives it amazing fire properties. It's got better fire resistance than steel. You know? it's, so it's, it's a great material when it comes to that. I think we need to be, like I said, looking first on the ground, what resources can we use here that are already available in the African condition? But then also taking technology from overseas like CRT and doing it ourselves. There's no reason why we can't. So I think there needs to be a movement towards materials. But again, I'd say that's you've probably touched on the most difficult component uh, that needs to change uh, in, in the construction industry. Mm, agreed. I think materials are always, there's always that um, learning curve in the beginning. Um, but like you said, there's, it just almost needs you know, one or two high profile precedent cases to show, oh, wow, this is actually possible. Um, and that typically gets, you know, the ball rolling. Um, I'm conscious of time, and there, uh, there's another question here from your Anita, Mark, about the, um, the the plastic bottle facade. I'm curious to know how the maintenance of the facade, that is the bottles, is. How does the design ensure the cleanliness of the bottles? 
So the bottles are pretty easy to maintain. Um, they generally you know, spray down once a year and because they're circular, they don't really collect any dust. So it's a, it's a pretty easy thing to maintain and it's not, it's not part of the sealed fabric of the building. So obviously you've got your double glazing behind that bottle facade that's actually sealing the building. So it's actually a pretty easy thing to maintain. Um, strangely enough, sometimes the simplest solutions are the easiest ones. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Okay, I think that's it. In terms of the questions, Mark, then I don't, see, I don't see any more. <clears throat> we will send, there's a lot of stuff that's come through now, but no, there, there are no more um, questions. So I think from my side, thank you to everybody for staying on. And um, it was great chatting. Thanks for all of the questions. Um, and thanks, Mark. It was great speaking with you again. Yeah, thanks everyone. Great to see you. I put my email address there if people want to take the conversation further. And yeah, we're happy to, to help in any way we can. Um, enjoy the rest of Rise Africa. There's some great sessions coming up um, and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Cheers. Thank you.